My name is Lloyd Wise, and I'm executive editor at Art Forum magazine. I'm very honored today to be speaking with Jordan Cantor, an artist, writer, and longtime Art Forum contributor. Jordan wrote a wonderful essay for Art Forum's annual December Best of the Year issue on the Metropolitan Museum of Art's blockbuster exhibition, Manet Degas. A painting from that show appears on the magazine's cover, Manet's incredible portrait, Berta Morisot in Mourning. This painting of Morisot, in fact, once belonged to Degas. The relationship between these two world historic artists was not one of two friends on equal footing, but there was, in fact, an asymmetry to their relationship. Is that right or wrong? Uh, well, I, I think it's right. I mean, we only have uh, the historical evidence that we have. Right. And I, this is not an original argument that I'm making. I'm in some sense taking my cue from the historical record, from the works that we see in the show, and also from some of the arguments that the curators are putting forth in the catalog, which I think is a very important contribution um, to the field. But I do think that we see in the works, in the show at least, um, an asymmetry. I mean, we see a whole yeah. a beautiful wall of drawings that uh, Degas made, portraits of Manet, and we see nothing equivalent of Manet looking back at Degas with as much attention or in, in any way like that. It's not to say that Manet uh, didn't find Degas to be an important friend and an important interlocutor or anything, but it's just, uh, it seems like there was some bit of asymmetry there. I don't know what to make of that exactly, and I think that there's room for more research in that area, especially around um maybe a more theoretical take on their their relationship as a as a rivalry and mm -hmm. um maybe to a common goal which might be called like art history or writing themselves into art history or actually being in conversation with um the art historical giants that they admired whether that would it be um Velasquez which is you know obviously part of the anecdote that you relate there or Goya or Ang, you know, the, the French tradition that was nearer to hand, or even somebody like Courbet, who was still alive in that time. Now, one painting you discuss at length is Degas' painting of uh, Manet and his wife. Uh, and this is a painting with a pretty amazing backstory. Um, it originates maybe from a trade the two of them were making of paintings, and then, you know, it kind of had its own fate. So I'm wondering if you could kind of tell that story. Sure. Well, I, I was delighted to see this painting in person in the show. I think yeah. it's um, it's normally in Japan these days, and I haven't had a chance to see it uh, in person. And there's an amazing story there. I think you're right that uh, there's an anecdote of them making a trade where Manet gave Degas a still life, and Degas gave Manet this portrait of uh, him sitting on a sofa, I think even maybe at his mother's house, um, listening to his wife, Suzanne, play piano. And sometime after that trade, uh, we don't know when or how or why exactly, but um, Manet apparently cut the portrait part of his wife's face off. So the, the right side of the painting, he cut out, cut out and essentially edited uh, Degas' piece, which is pretty bold and quite... <laughs> quite violent maybe. Anyway, Degas takes it back and I think intends to restore the painting to its original state. And we know that because between the time that the photograph was taken, where you see just the cropped version in the background and the time when he dies, he pastes that fragment onto a larger canvas with essentially space to repaint what had been excised by Manet but that remained unfinished when he died. So the, the work that we have now and the work that's in the show is one that has the kind of forever unfinished restoration. And interestingly, not the only mutilated painting in the exhibition, right? There's also the Maximilian. Yeah, exactly. So um, that, that was a painting that I understand was damaged uh, at some point in mm -hmm. Manet's studio. And after he died, his heirs cut it up. Degas, who survived Manet by many, many years, avidly collected those pieces to, to kind of reconstruct that image. And in fact, traded some of his own work um, to dealers to get the fragments back together. And similarly to the double portrait, 
mounted them on a large uh, canvas in approximately the position uh, where they had been before it was cut up and had that in his apartment. Was that driven just by his, you know, friendship, his artistic admiration of Manet or had Manet's star at that point really risen? Was there a market for his work? So the Met has done amazing shows in the last yeah. <laughs> that I've seen in my life. And one of the most memorable actually is about Degas' own collection. And I think that's one way to answer this question is that Degas saw his own practice as an artist heavily informed with art history. And he was very uh, interested in his place in art history. And he also bought contemporary art of artists like Cezanne, who uh, were younger than than he was. So I think part of it is his own sort of collecting sense mm -hmm. and his uh, wanting to, you know, build a story of the art that mattered to him. And part of it also probably was, you know, more deeply connected to this meaningful relationship that he had right. with me. Right. Right. Now, just to return to this uh, this amazing painting uh, by Degas of Manet and the wife that was cropped, and then this this canvas was adhered to the side. Um, this is a painting that has special meaning to you personally. You're also an artist with a very serious studio practice, and this painting has played a role in a work you made in, I believe, 2011, that took uh, both the form of an artist book and a video. I was just very fascinated with that image and with sort of the history of uh, mm -hmm. iconoclasm in that. Looking at particularly the pose uh, of Manet in that in that painting as Degas pictured him reminded me a lot of an image of melancholy by Albrecht Dürer, who's another artist who I've spent time thinking about. And so looking at that image, I sort of saw a lot of um, things that I related to and was interested in. And for the piece that you're referencing, I made a work of 166 photocopies, I think, starting with the source image. And each is a successive copy of the image before, um, which creates uh, the degradation of the apparatus of the photocopier, which from one copy to the next is not visible, but when you see it across 166 iterations of copies of copies of copies, you see the invisibility of the apparatus come to the fore in that it eats the image basically. And in the right. end, the 166th uh, frame is a white monochrome. But your acts of appropriation in your practice, do you see them as transgressive per se or not at all i yeah. i or i don't some you would have to tell me what you see from mm -hmm. from from my point of view it's much more about wanting to make a connection to history and wanting to yeah. reach out and be in conversation across time and i think that art is one of the places where you can do that i think that's much more about um where I'm coming from with historical reference in my work than trying to uh, reclaim space. Yeah. But it's interesting. I mean, that, you know, um, an artistic strategy like appropriation or a homage uh, can take on so many different meanings or valences depending on, you know, the subject matter and the particular artist that's using it. They're not um, monolithic in their meaning. Maybe it just means the category is too broad. And right. it's up to us right now to kind of um, put language to some different strains or some different tendencies and maybe identify that. I mean, the question of history and an artist's relationship to history uh, and relationship to the past is something that also comes up in your essay. Uh, you have this really wonderful, you conclude with this really wonderful appeal to younger artists, uh, expressing a hope that they will, and I'm going to quote you here, uh, take the likely rivalrous energy in the show back to their own practices in the form of the raw ambition to make history both personal and new. And I guess I'm wondering, could you elaborate on that a little bit or talk a little bit more about what that might mean for an artist? One of the reasons why I'm so attracted to Manet has to do with recognizing in him his own attraction to Velazquez and the ways in which he used art history, art history from 200 years before his own time as a way to animate an extremely contemporary practice and um, both try to I, 
look forwards and backwards at the same time. And so that has always been one way that I think about making paintings and making my own work is um, kind of having one eye in history and having, you know, mainly one foot in the present. And so I feel like the kind of use value of a show like this beyond its kind of scholarly contribution is really from my perspective for artists and just the, the amount of like painting information that is in that show is mind boggling. You use the phrase of uh, painting information uh, just now. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. What is that? So I think painting information is the information you get from standing in front of the painting not from looking at a reproduction of the painting. So I think a lot of it might be just facture, paint handling. Yeah. Um, a lot of it might be uh, scale relative to your body and how close you are looking, looking at the painting or things that you see in the painting that you don't see in reproduction. There, there are a series of photographs actually um, in Manet's 1983 retrospective catalog that he had at, at the Met as well of paintings of his shown in raking light, like with light coming from the side as well as light coming from the front and comparing those two views. And one of the really interesting things there is that sometimes Manet's brush strokes followed the contours of the things that they represented. So like you could see like a cheek was rendered with a brush stroke that's like that. And so on an infra thin level, when you're standing in front of it, when you actually rotate your vision a little bit in raking light, it will create like a heightened illusionism of depth where actually his paintings don't quite look as flat as they look when you just see them lit frontally. That is painting information. That's painting information that you can only really get if you're standing in front of a painting as a three-dimensional object with, you know, your own eyes looking at it. I think that's also part of, I, I would say, the importance of the museum as a place where they could meet because it created a kind of textbook in three dimensions for the artists that were uh, working in Paris at that time as students. And they they talk about that a little bit in the catalog, just the, sort of the history of um, the Louvre and, and its role in education at that time, and the education of artists at that time. But I think it, that it created sort of a shared vocabulary of references. That, yeah, um, so, I mean, it's so interesting that, and, you know, they met in Degas was copying a uh, painting by Velasquez. And I, you also bring this up, the, the question of copying within um, artistic pedagogy is a really interesting one. It's a new world now, and, and the status of the original and the copy are, are, have different stakes at this time in history. And um, yeah, if you can get something from looking at the past, like, let's do it. Well, thank you very much, Jordan, for uh, speaking with me. I really, really enjoyed this conversation, and we are just so honored to have your words in the magazine and this incredible image on the cover. Thank you, Lloyd. I am honored to stand here talking about Manet and Degas with you, and uh, to have seen the show with an eye to writing about it is a great privilege. So I appreciate that.